Well, thanks so much for joining us this evening for Female Founders and Angel Investments. Super excited to be chatting with two of my favorite women, Agatha Chindu and Heather Terry. Um, before I have them introduce themselves, we want to know who's in the audience, who we're talking to. So we have two quick poll questions. If you could just answer those, and then we will get started. So first, we want to know if you're an entrepreneur. And then we want to know if you've received investment. Okay, looks like majority are entrepreneurs and majority have not received investment. Um, so I'm excited to talk about friendly money. <laughs> um, to kick off, my name is Gian Doherty. I am the Associate Director of Entrepreneur Programming here at Innovation Studio. I am also an entrepreneur. I am the co-founder of award-winning Organic Bath Co. based out of Boston. And so far, we are self-funded, have not gone after any funds yet, um, but perhaps maybe open to it. Fun fact, Heather Terry is our business coach. Um, so we'll see what she advises us. But my personal long-term goal is to be an angel investor. I cannot wait until I'm at the point where I can invest in women and black owned businesses. Um, so to kick off, starting with Agatha, I'd love for you both to introduce yourselves, your business and one fun fact. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me. My name is Agatha Achindu. I am an integrative nutritionist and health coach and the founder of Yummy Spoonfuls Organic, the first nationally distributed organic food for kids sold in Walmart stores nationwide today. Um, a fun fact about me is that I love ice cream. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Heather K. Terry. I am the co-founder and CEO of Good Sam Foods. It is a chocolate company primarily, but we are also have coffee um, and different things like macadamia nuts and avocado oil coming out later this year. We work in snacks, um, primarily keto snacks, so sugar-free. Um, we work on a direct trade model, which means that we work directly with our farmers and all of our farms are regeneratively farmed. So we don't engage in any type of monocropping. We work in places like Colombia, Kenya, Ghana, um, many places that, um, around the world. Um, we started up on Thrive Market in November and um, have had a really good run so far. We're exclusive there. I've been a CPG veteran uh, in the natural product space, primarily food and beauty for the last 13 years. Uh, my first startup was Nibmore Chocolates. And um, then I went on to run the sales department for the clean beauty brand, SW Basics. And a fun fact about me, I just got a puppy and he's like freaking <laughs> out. It's great. <laughs> and her puppy is adorable. If you want to find Heather on Instagram. Um, and Throughout the conversation, please drop any questions you have in the chat. We're going to make this very interactive. And I know that funding, angel investing, we have so many questions. So feel free to drop them. Um, Heather, you're no stranger to angel investment. Can you please just set the tone and define it for us? What does it mean? Yeah, so typically angels are people who have a little bit of net worth. They have some money in the bank. Um, you know, you really... There are people who will claim they're angels who aren't accredited investors. You you do want to look for accredited investors. It's it it's people who can take the risk, right? They have a certain net worth that allows them to put money into companies and to understand the risk, especially at the startup stage. So most angels, I mean, I've seen angels come in as low as $5,000 all the way up to a half a million, right? Depending on who they are. I would say the majority of most angels play somewhere and, and Agatha, you can, you can certainly um, chime in here, but between 25 and 150, I think that's like the sweet spot for most angels. But again, they can be people who, you know, um, people who you meet through networking, um, you know, researching other companies to find out who their angels were, but they're looking for startups where they believe in not only the product, but even, even more so usually in the founder or founding team. Yep. And then, you know, to also level set, what is, what is both of your relationships to angel investment? Agatha, can you go first? So for me, I mean, I know, uh, I have a few friends today who are angel investors, but I remember 
when I was starting my brand in 2006, I had a couple of angel investors who wanted to invest in my company. And I think the first person was, oh, I'm going to give you $50,000 for 25% of your company. And to me, I was like, no. <laughs> then the second person came who wanted to give $750,000 for 75% wow. of our company. And I remember him saying, oh, it's better to have 25% of a couple of million dollars or to have 100% of nothing. Yikes. And I was like, well, I would rather have 100% of nothing. At that point, it was interesting to me. But with my company, what happened to us? We got quickly to a point where we were a little bit too big for angel investors and a little bit too small for venture capitalists. So I never, we never went with angel investor. Though, I mean, as we get into this conversation, we'll get into the part of what actually happened to us. But it's an interesting sport for somebody. Yeah, and who I would wants, argue that actually wants to dance in it. You had sharks, not angels coming to the yes. table, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Heather. Yeah. So relationship. Yeah, angels. Um, I had angels at Nipmore. Um, we had angels at SW Basics. Um, I have what I would consider angel investors in Good Sam. So I've had a long relationship with angel investors. Um, in the beginning, they were people who were friends of mine and Jennifer's, um, my co-founder at Nipmore. Look, we're really lucky, you know, and it was really more Jen. I have to give her credit for that. She had friends who had money and I was like, oh God, thank God you have friends who have money because all my friends were <laughs> actors. All my friends were actors and I was like, they have like no money. So what are we going to do here? Um, and she was really able to go out and raise. And so, you know, Nipmore owes a great debt for um, even still existing just based on the fact that Jen was able to raise capital in a way that I never could have, right? Um, just at that time, because I didn't have the, the network. Um, as time moved on, I think for me, I, I started meeting people and, um, you know, just networking and asking people and putting decks in front of people. And, you know, you never really know who's going to show up and who's going to do it. And so um, I just kept, I just kept going and doing that. And with Good Sam, you know, I've been in the industry for such a long time now that I know the people who are angel players and who, you know, rich people now. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, guess, well, not so much rich people, but like even people who are just more seasoned investors in the space, right? Because not, not, every angel is necessarily like of a high, high net worth. Some of them are not right, but they'll give you 10 grand and you're like, okay, great. Like 10 grand will get me somewhere in the beginning. Right. Um, so, you know, even with, at Good Sam, we piecemealed a lot of this first round together off of, you know, 10, 25, $50,000 investments um, because that was what was required of us. And we, we found those people, but that was primarily through um, my network and beyond brands network, but it's just because I've been in the industry for a really long time. Yeah. So what is an angel investment round? What does that typically look like? Is that a hundred thousand? Is it 500,000? Do people get angel investment as they go around, go along, or is it just one big round? It depends, right? So for me, um, at Nibmore, the first angel round was 250,000. At Good Sam, the first angel round was about 600,000, right? So it can go, it can fluctuate. I would say an angel round, I don't know, Agatha, maybe you have an opinion. I don't, I've never seen one over a million with angels that I've never seen that. It typically, like, typically you're looking at a $500,000 situation max, um, 750, that's a lot of, probably a lot of people getting involved at that point and, and that gets complicated. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we're really looking, you know, I always say to most startups, even as a consultant, I know um, one, of, one of my uh, people who I advise 
I'm on their advisory board is listening. Um, and I just told her, I was like, look, 250,000 is going to get you out the gate if you're raising money, right? Like that's really what you need to have a good base in CPG to do some marketing, really get yourself out there, um, make sure the, the product doesn't have problems and you've got some inventory you're sitting on. Um, 250 will get you a long way, right? As a scrappy entrepreneur. I don't know, Agatha, maybe you've had a, a little bit of a different experience. I think for me, to answer to Gianna's question, like, the range is if you think that the first angel was offering $50,000 and actually there were two people, 25 each, and the second angel was 750 and was one person, but then just wanted so much out of it, right? Um, I would say It, it, I haven't played because I ended up not getting money. Unlike you, Heather, you got money a lot from angel investors. It's a space that I did. My only experiences were those two people. I really didn't. But I want to get to a place where I can become an angel investor because I know the difference that it's it can make in someone's business, right? It could be $10,000 that really stops somebody from closing shop, but then it will come from a place of, I don't want to just, I don't want to own your company. I don't want to change your ideas. I want to invest in you so you can keep doing what you're doing and keep your doors open. Mm -hmm. And being a founder, you probably would be able to give such amazing advice. Agatha, when these angel investors approached you, were they friends? Were they part of your network? Had Yummy Spoonfuls already launched? How did they find you? So the first, the first one was through a lawyer. And the second one was through Whole Foods. I honestly don't know how they found me, but at this point, I'd been in business for maybe seven months. I was in Whole Foods in my local region. That's how the second person found me. And I think the intrigue was more about my why, why I was doing this. And the fact that they could see easily that I could, this is something scalable because it doesn't matter whether it's an angel investor or a venture capitalist. They want to see that you can articulate what it is that you're trying to do and how you are going to get from point A to point B if they give you that money. And how quickly you can do it <laughs> a lot yeah. of times. Um, and I saw someone ask the same question in the audience. You know, They want to get angel investment for their company. Heather, how would you get ready for that? You know, should you already have launched? Should you be pre-revenue? Yeah, so I would say, first of all, I want to acknowledge kind of the elephant in the room, which is women, and particularly women of color, are historically and statistically grossly undercapitalized um, to the point where it's almost embarrassing in the investment community at this point. Um, I've been doing this for almost 14 years and the numbers are still as embarrassing as they were 14 years ago. And we have gone through this very woke period, right? So it's, it's like, I'm still waiting for something to change. Right. And I'm not, um, look, it's been, I've, I have taken great pains to raise capital and it has been difficult for me. So I cannot, um, I have, I, ca I can't ignore the fact that my, um, you know, black, brown, Asian sisters have had an even more difficult time doing it. Right. Um, I'm lucky because I'm a white woman. And so I'm able to raise it more easily. You know, also, even when you think of friends and family rounds, John, um, white women have a more easy time getting a friends and family round together than BIPOC women, right? So um, let's acknowledge that here because um, it's, yes, things are maybe getting a little bit better, but they're not getting better fast enough. So I wanna acknowledge that um, if you are, uh, if you are a woman of color, it is going to be harder for you. So I say to everybody who I work with, um, whether they are BIPOC or white or a man or a woman, regardless of any of that, right, but more so for my BIPOC women out there who, who are listening, um, be super prepared because you will be held to a standard that everybody else will not be held to, period. 
you need to answer those questions clearly, concisely. You have to know your numbers inside and out, and you have to be compelling. So if you need to go, you know, take some workshops or, or get a friend to like, listen to you say your pitch 50,000 times until it just rolls off your tongue. If you need uh, to find a mentor or somebody who just is invested in this space, who said like, I want to give you time so that you can, I'm going to pick apart your PL and I'm going to just shred you um, in this meeting, right? Because I want you to be prepared. I want you that I want you to walk out of that room or get off that Zoom. And for those investors to be like, wow, wow, that woman knows her stuff. How could you not invest in her? So the preparedness, right? Your idea can be really great, but that preparedness going into the room as a woman and especially a woman of color is the most important thing that you can do to raise capital. It's unfair. I don't want to acknowledge that. It's deeply unfair, right? But it is the reality of the situation. And if you can own that and know it and prepare for it, you will be, you will be more successful on this path. Yeah, and thank you for acknowledging that, Heather. And I know that's why I want to be able to give back as soon as I'm able to do so. And I'm sure, Agatha, you feel similarly. Um, so a question in the chat is, you know, let's get to this one. I thought an angel investor was required to be a high net worth individual with a minimum net worth of $1 million. That's what you were saying is an equity an accreditor investor, right, Heather? Accredited investor, yes. But I believe you can have up to 20 non-accredited investors, correct? You can. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've looked into them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, look, I would just say like, you gotta be really careful, right? Because unless you're kind of a little bulletproof, like in the sense that you feel really, really good about your company and you feel like, wow, I'm, I can, I really think, and we all think that, but like, you better have the numbers to back it. Do not take money from your friends or your family who don't have that kind of money. You will not be able to sleep at night, believe me. Like, it's not worth it. Um, because they don't understand it, right? They don't, they don't know why what you set on paper won't happen. An accredited investor understands that. They understand the risk. So yep. unless you are really prepared again, like you are really prepared, do not take that money from your mom, your grandma, your best friend, your, you know, whoever. And, and Agatha, I'm sure you've had this experience and this, this thought and conversation as well. Yeah, I think that's such an important piece because an angel investor, somebody's accredited knows that this is a risk that they are taking. They are giving you $50,000, $100,000, or whatever it is, that they might never get that money back. But your auntie or your grandma or somebody is giving you $500. They know that they are going to get that $500 back. If that money, relationships get burned, things happen. So I know people get, you get to a point where you're desperate which is another thing. Really, if you're looking for money, I say, don't use your money first. Try to get the money before you use yours. Because when you try to look for money from a place of desperation, you make decisions that you might end up regretting. Yep. Um, and I get that because you said no to angel investment. I want to ask this question to you first from the chat. How do you recommend assessing for yourself whether bootstrapping or receiving angel investment is the right move for you? I think you really have to figure out what your pain points are. One, what you need the money for, how badly you need it, what you're willing to sacrifice for it. We bootstrap for... I think 11 years because we wow. didn't want to, one, I wasn't willing or ready to give the money, the company away for so little because I could see the numbers and I knew that the difficulties that I personally was having was because of color, because we, we had the numbers to prove it. We were selling off the shelves. We had cash flow. There were all the things, but again, we were in that sweet spot. We weren't making a couple of million dollars at that time for the bigger guys to come in. And we were making just a little bit too, too much for an angel investor to make sense for us. And 
when I finally decided that we were going to bring in money, I started looking for the money that I was comfortable in. So it was almost like a full-time job, meeting people and seeing people's faces really shocked when I'm like, no, it's okay, we don't want the money. It wasn't because we had too much. I just got into a point where we could manage what we had and the company was making enough to pay for itself. So we, we weren't looking for money. So I would say one, see where your money is going. Is there a place that you can, you can take a loan so you're not bringing in an angel investor or borrow anything else. This is just straight loan that you can pay back, right? And it's so personal. You would really have to, but the one thing that I even when you're bootstrapping, just make sure that you're not liquidating your family's funds to bootstrap this business because that's something we did, which till this day, I'm so grateful to God because we are one of the few that are lucky that we spend that much money and made it back. A lot of people don't. So you would have to be mindful. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Heather? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, that it's, I mean, bravo to you, Agatha, because I mean that, you know, it, it's really hard. I've seen marriages fall apart. I've seen best friendships fall apart. I've seen, I've seen it all because, you know, you get to that point of desperation and, it gets really ugly, really fast. People who you always thought you'd have a relationship with, you know, just it's gone forever. And, you know, look, that's a whole topic about um, who you go uh, uh, yes. with. <laughs> Make sure it's someone who, who you could sacrifice in your life eventually if you have to, because, because right. it's very real that way. Um, like the Hunger very, Games. <laughs> it's like the Hunger Games. Yeah, I really. Like to get so money from you, I'm willing to lose you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Or going into business with you, I'm willing to lose you, right? Because it's, um, it happens way more often than people talk about. Um, and yeah, so I would just say that, you know, that's such great advice, Agatha, the, the whole idea of, um, of just being really, really careful about your own money before you, you touch your own family worth, um, you have to be really, really careful about that. I know like dreams and all of that, but, but there, there's a lot of companies and, and Gian, you know this, cause you've known me for a while. I've, I've advised startups to close. I've advised them. I've been like, you should shut your doors. Like if you are going to go into the well, and this is the last $90,000 you have in the bank personally, you should close your doors. That's right. It, it does not make any sense to keep going. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. I'm totally in alignment with that. Yep. Heather keeps it real. <laughs> I can say that as a friend and as someone who, you know, you also help advise. Um, so here's a question. When is the right time to pursue angel investments? Is it better to pursue pre-revenue or when you're already making sales? I think in this climate, you have to have sales unless you have like a unicorn idea. And Agatha, I don't know if you agree with that, but I think it's a really rough climate right now. Um, COVID has changed things. Investors are still very skittish. They want a sure bet or as sure as they can get. And they also, you know, most investors, and this hasn't changed much in the last 14 years, but most of them want to see that you have a little bit of your own skin in the game. They want to see that like you did sell fund, that you did bootstrap to some point of revenue that makes sense and that it's working. Um, the one big pitfall I see when people start to go out and raise money outside of their own friends or family, or at least for those of us that can, because that's again, statistically another place, you know, most, most women and most women of color do not have those networks of okay, um, people, friends and family. Right. So that's a, that's a whole other statistical ball of wax to, to un, to unwind. Um, but make sure your margins are really healthy on your product. Um, because they're looking for that. If you have a 20% margin, you know, these guys know what it means to play in CPG in particular. Um, you know, Agatha, you and I both know if you've got a 20% margin, you may as well close your doors today. Like there's no right. way you're getting out of that, right? Unless you can redu reduce your cost of goods significantly to get a much higher margin, you are pretty much screwed if you're going into grocery retail, right? You can do a little bit better in D2C, but like they're looking for that. They're, they're looking for those traps. And it goes back to what I said before about that preparedness, right? About understanding the market, understanding what's required of you when you show up, 
right? And what they're going to expect of you um, in order to put money into your business. It's a tough climate out there. So you've got it, you've got to be buttoned up. Yeah. And so to the next question, what is a common mistake people make when they're pitching investors? What's a no-no? I think for me, I would say the most common mistake is not knowing your numbers. Because I love you, Agatha. You're like the best. <laughs> I say this all the time. <laughs> yeah. I think, and that's where they, they get people all the time. Yeah. Because you just talked about, Heather just said something like, if your margins are 20%, you shouldn't, even, you shouldn't even be looking for an investor at that point. You need to figure out how to either scale, increase volume, increase something, efficiency, so you can, that's so important. So if you're talking to an investor, if you're pitching and they're asking you numbers, I watch Shark Tank all the time. And I'm looking at somebody, I'm like, oh no. They don't know. Yeah. Like, I had to stop watching Shark Tank. It stressed me out. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> pleasurable anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do. I watch it. When I have time, I do. I even do replays. But your numbers is something that you have to you have to know, even if you don't know anything else. Your numbers. What is a typical I'm, margin in food, Agatha? Because I know in beauty they're good, but what is it in food? I, I think in food, a good margin would be over forty five percent. Yes, has to. Yes, that's a good margin, mm -hmm. and you even. You want to, you, when you're looking at products, even when, when I'm working on recipes, I'm really thinking about that. Like, what is the cost? Because you want to be able to have the margin in there because everybody, by the time you plug in, distribute all the, this, that, 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 there is nothing. Yeah, everyone wants a piece. That's yeah. something. I've, there's a broker. There's yeah. always somewhere to pay someone a fee. And I, I know that it's so easy when you are a startup because you're everything and you're not taking a salary. It might be you're taking a little bit of money. You're thinking like, oh no, we're making money. Really dig deep and plug in all these numbers because if you grow, your company is going to be a real company. And that margin, you realize that, oh, what you thought was 30% is honestly nothing. And what are the other numbers that entrepreneurs need to know besides your margin? What would you ask as an investor? Are you asking me, Dion, or are you asking me either? Both of you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I do a lot of angel investing and I nail people all the time. So um, I nail them <laughs> all the time and it's around numbers and it's always, um, I cannot tell you how many startups have come to me without a financial model, which is a huge no-no, huge, massive. Do not go to investors without a model. You can go to your friends and family without a financial model. You cannot go to accredited investors without a financial model, period. Um, but I nail people on things. Margin is always number one and they don't, I think the biggest disappointment in that, and for all of you out there listening, the biggest disappointment for me in that is I say to them, I see the margin is only X. What are you going to do to change it, to improve it? And they, they're like, I don't know, like it's going to grow. So, I mean, it's very nonchalant. You know, if you're, if your product is working and you're in the twenties, but you know how to increase that margin, you are in a much better position than somebody who has no idea what that is. So it's always margin. It's always um, personnel. People cost a lot of money, right? Oh, yeah. And you have to be scrappy and lean when you are starting and angels want to see that. So if you, if you are only making 500,000 or a million dollars top line, and you have a 600,000 personnel line, I mean, like, I'm looking at you, like, who are you paying? Who are you paying? <laughs> like, yeah. are you, like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm a little confused. Like, why do you need so many people 
for a business that's not even doing a million dollars in sales or not even $500,000 in sales. So be really careful about personnel, be really careful about consultants, right? Um, get, extract the value from those consultants. Like every, every startup needs consultants, extract the value from them as quickly as you can, unless you really need that person long-term and then out, right? Like you've got to, you've got to keep the overhead low, right? Because consultants are expensive. They can be five, six, $10,000 a month. So if you're going to hire somebody like that, like really use them and get out because you may as well be hiring a full-time person at that point. Right. So personnel margin, um, Oh, what else do I get them on? It sounds terrible to say it that way, but I do. I really do get them on. Marketing. Um, too, yeah, marketing. Um, too many SKUs. Too many SKUs is a big one. People think they have to keep innovating SKU after SKU after SKU, and you don't. You've got to have like your heroes in the beginning. Um, and you've got to run with those heroes, right? And, and really blow those heroes out. Get that modicum of success, and you can iterate and innovate out of it when you're inching more toward profitability or margins are getting better. So that's primarily where I look first. Um, there's certainly other little things, but, but those are the big ones. Yeah. I, I remember you digging into, um, personnel and you really have to make sure that you get everything out of your employees. I remember a few years ago when we were discussing organic bath co, Heather was like, that's a, a well-paid packer. <laughs> They need wow. to be doing more <laughs> than just packing boxes at that price. Yeah. And then you guys did. And she yep. was more than capable. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a hard conversation. I remember crying because I was emotional about it. Um, but you know, it, it all comes down to the bottom line and making things happen. Um, and making, you know, if you're bootstrapping, making all your sacrifices worth it. Um, someone asked if we could define margin a bit more, like what margin are we referring to when we said 45% is good? Is it gross margin? Is it EBITDA, EBITDA? Um, Heather, can you answer that? Yeah, so your margin is really all of your costs on the company side, right? So it's the packaging, the product, the shipping into your warehouse, right? It's everything that it costs, your cogs are everything it costs to get it into your warehouse ready to ship to somebody else. The margin is the price between that warehouse and that first point of contact, because guess what, you guys, it's all the money you're going to make is whatever that first point of contact is and you, that that's your margin. So if you have a product for, you know, a dollar, it gets to your warehouse, it's a dollar, right? And you sell it for $2, you have a hundred percent margin. You made a dollar on a dollar, right? Um, if it's, if you, if you sell it for $2, if you can only sell it for a dollar 50, then you've got a 50% margin. If you can only sell it for a dollar 25, you've got a 25% margin, right? So you have to remember when you have your cost of goods, this is why beauty is such a great industry. It typically is low cost of goods and high retail and buyers will buy it at a higher price to put it at a higher retailer, uh, retail food, because it's a necessity. You know, not everybody needs a super special face cream, um, but food is a necessity, right? So food categories are typically lower margin products um, and they're difficult because you need a lot of volume to get food cost of goods down because a lot of food is also commoditized in a lot of ways, right? So these are the, and, and packaging is expensive in food, right? So when you bring a, if you bring a product in for a dollar into your warehouse, and you charge $2 to the distributor, right? Then the distributor is going to charge $2 and, tw and 40, no, $2 cents. and about 60 cents That's right. to the grocery store. And then the grocery store is going to put it on the shelf for about five, five oh. bucks, five twenty. Yes. Right. So is my chocolate bar Five dollar is it worth five dollars and twenty cents to the consumer? Will they? Will the market bear that cost? Yeah. Right now, the only price I'm making is that margin that I first sell it off to. But it's as the yeah, as the company, you have to be aware of all those steps along the way, right? Um, and so another question in the Q and A here is, why do you think startups are not prepared? You know, and how do you suggest they get better prepared to know all their numbers? 
I mean, I think it's because you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, so you better get to Googling <laughs> and figuring out, watching Shark Tank, you know, Googling what investors ask, what investors look for. I think they can take training though. I actually had um, training from my local SBA. There are lots of free training. Yep. People, people go into business for many reasons. Some of them is a passion. Some of them is, oh, I lost my job. A lot of us go into business not prepared. But to succeed in business, you need to prepare when you're there. And it's not just Googling is not enough. It can be a mentor. It can be a coach. It can be look for services from your local SBA. But you need to to succeed in the game, you need to learn how to play the game and business is a ferocious game. Yeah, I think often entrepreneurs, it's glamorized kind of in the same way. You know, I, 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 I see this all the time. Um, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is playing the, uh, the misfit teen on Growing Pains long before he was, um, you know, did the Titanic. And business is the same way. It's a business, right? And I think oftentimes we tangle it in our own personal story, right? Oh, I created this product because I was suffering from a health concern or my kid. Yes, this is all beautiful and wonderful marketing messaging, but there has to be a strong business base underneath that or you will never succeed. And I think we just glamorize it. You know, what we see on Instagram or what we see people, or we see the acquisition and we don't realize that like, you know, I built Nibmore, which is still a national brand. I hired, I mean, this is something I say to people and they look at me like I have three heads because I've been doing this so long. But in those beginning days, I was an actor who started a chocolate company. And there were many things I took from my acting career that served me, but I did not know how to read a PL and I did not know QuickBooks. And I hired a woman to come in for a couple of sessions, you know, a couple hundred bucks. And I was like, you have to teach me what I have to look at because I am struggling in that boardroom. They are not taking me seriously. I don't know where the holes in the boat are. Like I am now in uncharted territory. And if I don't get my shit together, I am going to be out of this business faster than I got into it. Right. And because that's the other thing too, right? You could get written out of your story if you have a great idea because you just don't know what you're doing. So yes, keep the emotional story for like Instagram and your pitch and all of that, but get your head on in behind the scenes. You have to know everything that's going on. You have to have very, very clear visibility into your numbers. That is the basis of everything that is good in business. Yep. And speaking to resources, are there any female focused grants or loans that you both, you know, either of you know about that you'd recommend for anyone in the audience to look into? I don't know if this is female, but I think it's Zen for minorities. There is the Zen Ventures that I think. I have to look the name to make sure. There's I Fund, I Fund Woman, which is kind of like Kickstarter geared towards women. There's Black Girl Ventures. I actually did their pitch competition um, a few months ago and took in second place. Um, that is, some, you know, that is very Googleable. <laughs> um, there's a lot of resources out there. I think there is. You know, I Fund Women is a great one. They've been around for a while and they do some great coaching in that um, group as well. Uh, and then, you know, finding out who's, who got invested in by who, there's another one, Astra, do you hear these ladies? I'll just send it to you, John, so you can, if there's a resource or something, or we can put it, it's Astra something. They run a women's boot camp for business. That's like three or 400 bucks. You get in front of a bunch of investors. You learn a lot, you know, about just running your business. They're, they're fantastic. They're out of New York. Um, really interesting structure um, that they've put together. It's like this crash course to kind of lay a fire under your butt to get it together. It's the get it together, put a fire under your butt, like boot camp for um, female entrepreneurs. So there are, you know, that's a very, again, a very Googleable thing um, to find these resource places that are going to help you along. And I think, I think I encourage everybody to look into those if you're, if you're struggling. 
Yep. And not just for women, Innovation Studio has a pitch program where you'll learn how to pitch, how to create your deck, and it's really beneficial. Um, a pitch, everyone should have their deck together because you can take pieces of it in and out for whatever is needed. Someone in the chat just mentioned the fellowship for female funders, founders run oh, by no. Capital yeah. Network. Yeah, I'm familiar with that one as well. Um, so let's switch over. I, I, we could talk about this all night, <laughs> and I hope one day we can do this in person. Um, but a quick poll, who in the audience would love to be an angel investor at some point? I'm raising my hand for that. All right, so 78% of us want to be angel investors. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, Heather, you know I want to be an angel investor. I talk about it all the time. I put it out there into the universe. How did you get started? Was there a class you took? No, there was not a class I took. Um, look, a little bit of it just took time, right? I was in the industry for a while and I had some success in the industry. And so I decided that I wanted to start investing in companies. And um, my husband and I kind of came together and said, do we, we, we want to do this? Let's do this. Um, and we started looking at different investments and different, um, brands that we really liked. You know, we have a, fo we have a really strong focus on obviously startups, female founded startups. Um, that's the majority of our portfolio. Um, and we, but we are very hawkish on numbers, right? So people know when they come to us, like I'll say to entrepreneurs, I'll be like, great, like this we love the product, but the numbers suck and like come back to us when you've changed something. Cause we're just, we're not putting in, we've been burned too. So we learned a little bit along the way too. Like we had some bad investments, which again, when you're accredited, you can, you can, you're like, okay, I can absorb that. It sucks. Like I'm kissing these money babies goodbye. And that really <laughs> blows, but you can absorb that. Right. So you're like, you know what you're getting into. Um, so it really was like about getting, having a little bit of money to play with and then saying, how are we going to do this? So my biggest, my biggest um, takeaway from it would be that, you know, and, and as, as a, you know, I, and I just said this about the entrepreneurs, but as a, uh, an investor, I wanted to give money to every sob story that came along, right? Of course, like I want to help everybody, but we realized really, really quickly after a few of those really harsh investments that that was not going to be the way to do this and that we had to be much more intentional and careful about where we were putting our money. So, you know, it's great to take money from people who just want to give it to you, but it's also a lot better when people will give you the truth and push you um, because it's going to make you better and your business better. Yeah. I, I imagine kind of being like Oprah, like you get 10,000 and you get 10,000. Um, I really wanted that, Gian. I really did. It was like, it felt so good in the beginning. And then when, you know, you have your first one or two close, you're like, oh man, that hurts. It hurts. It hurts my soul. Right. Um, and, and it sucks. So yeah. 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 And Agatha, I know you want to be an angel investor. So will you be looking in your own network? Do you want to join a group? How do you think you'll start that process? I think I would look in my network first. That's how mm -hmm. I will start because the say change starts at home. I know tons of people who weren't as lucky as I was in this journey of entrepreneurship. So I really want to be able to look at a business plan. I know it's not fashionable, but I want to be able to look at somebody. It's like, okay, just put a little business plan because you need to not only think it and be woo about it, but you need to write it out, like what's in your head. So somebody can look at it and it makes sense and then give them money. But from a place of, well, I might get it back or I might not without me having to really change, keep them up at night, all the way I pray for that day when I can easily, I can in my head say lose a couple of hundreds of thousands or it might be millions that I know I'm losing it because I change lives. That's my goal. So it will start in my community because there are a lot and then hopefully it, I create a ripple effect so they too can touch somebody else 
Yes. So I love that. And Agatha, when you invest, do you also want an advisory seat? Do you want to advise as well? Or do you want to just do your initial, you know, due diligence, send the money and then that's it? <laughs> my, my hope would be depending on what the business needs. I don't just want to sit on an advisory board when I don't have anything to advise. If I am investing, if I meet somebody who is in the food industry, right? I would very likely want to be on the advisory board because for 25 years I've been in this space. I have taken product from my kitchen all the way to Walmart. So I know the space in my sleep. I can help you there. But if I'm going to invest in your company, I know nothing. Rather than take that seat, I'm happy to give that money and be in the background and somebody else who would add value to your company, do it. But honestly, I think for, especially for startup, if you're really going to take money from somebody, it's good to, to get money from someone who is not just bringing money, they are bringing that added value. Like they really know that space. Yeah. They can Perfect. help you because money, money sometimes doesn't, doesn't go as far as you would think. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. very true. And Heather, when you and your husband invest, are you looking to advise as well? It depends. You know, I now, um, I now invest a lot alongside my partners at Beyond Brands because um, they're industry veterans. And so oftentimes we come together as angels to make those investments and we all put a little bit in, right, in order to take a chance on somebody. Um, and sometimes it's not in my area of expertise. Like we're getting ready to do one in beverage right now. Beverage is not my area of expertise. I have one other beverage investment. Um, it's not my favorite space, but I see the intrinsic value of that uh, particular brand. And so I'm going to participate, but um, you know, I like it's the same to Agatha's point. I like to have, bring something to the table, right? I like to be able to say, okay, well, I'm here because you know, just sitting on a board is really boring if you don't have something to offer. And it can be actually like a big pain in the ass. So it's like, as an angel, you know, I would never request a board seat if it, the company was too small. Like it, it's more of like a loose advisory sometimes in those beginning days. And then, you know, if with Michael and I, if we decide we're going to put in more, if we go into like a series A or a series seed round, then we some, and if we lead it or we're, you know, second lead, we might ask for a board seat that has happened to us a few times, but, um, we try to play more in the angel space and to stay, um, more advisory because for us, that's really where we like to play. That's, that's just where we feel like we have the most, we can add the most value. And then while investors should realize the risk and understand that they can lose it all, um, what's a reasonable time frame to see a positive return, assuming that the investment does well? Is it years? I mean, everyone would love to see their money back in three to five years. It almost never happens. <laughs> Agatha and I are both laughing, but... Um, it, it, it like never happens, right? I mean, I I have yet to see the three to five year plan like really play out the way anybody says it's going to, right? right. Yeah, it, it happens when it's supposed to happen, right? And you you get some that you're, you know, and that's the other thing is as an angel investor. So like for us as angels, we have money spread all over and we have it spread in different amounts in different places based on the bet that we were kind of taking, right? Um, our hope is obviously that one of those is going to hit, right? That's always the hope. Um, you're going to lose a lot more than you're going to win, right? And then there's going to be those ones that you've held on to. You know, I have, I have friends that have been doing this a lot longer than me. And, and I remember um, a, a dear friend of mine in the industry who's a lawyer who has probably a, like 200 investments in the space, right? And he forgot about a company that he invested in like 10 or 15 years ago. And suddenly he got a check. He got a check from them that was like four times his investment. He was like, this is amazing, right? So a little bit of the angel game is spreading money around in small amounts and kind of hoping that eventually some of it's going to come back to you. You're going to make it back and that you're going to do a little bit better, right? 
And so you both know me. I like to get real. <laughs> um, so for our final minutes here, you know, as a founder, I think raising money is glorified. Um, do you have a story that you can share that kind of talks about the non-glorification of raising money or and or what are some things you think we don't talk about when it comes to raising money, but we should? Whoever wants to jump in. I think for me, one of the things that we don't talk about um, is that not all money is good money. That you really have to do due diligence when it comes to where you want to take money. Because the one thing that you would want so much could be the one thing that comes and completely breaks your business. Because relationships as crazy when you have money from somebody who sees the uh, I want to say see the see the see the the bigger picture of the money but are not tied to the vision of the founders and if you are very tied to that vision it could be a problem so don't just take money because it's money do your work if you're compatible, if you have the same vision for where you are today that you're making $5,000 to where you want to be when you're making $5 million. All those things do matter. I think we don't talk about that enough. And for us women of color, just the difficulties in that space and the fact that don't look for money when you're desperate and you do the work, really do the work to see if this business is scalable. If not, don't waste your time. Don't just waste your time. Yeah, um, that's great advice. And I, I'm gonna answer it a little bit differently. So I, and I totally agree with everything Agatha just said, just, just to be clear, um, in this, landscape um, that we're in right now in this COVID, post-COVID, very difficult, um, always difficult for women, by the way, like, it's just like this always for us. So it just is what it is. Um, and that's not me complaining. Again, that's me. That is a statistical fact, right? Period. It's not a complaint. It is a statistical fact. Um, I am always raising money. I am always raising money even when I'm not raising money. I am always talking to money people even when I'm not raising money because I never know when I'm going to need more money, right? So also I think um, a lot of people think it is like Shark Tank. It's that glorification again, like I'm gonna walk in, I'm gonna do the presentation. They're gonna give me hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's gonna be over. It's a lot more like being an actor and actually you know, having been an actor for so many years before I was doing this, that served me, right? Audition one, audition two, three, four. It could be the fifth audition you book the job. It could be the 150th audition that you book the job. It's the same thing with money. And to add at this point, I also want to say not all money is created equal and not every investor is right for you. You know, I love that Agatha has said in this because I've done the same thing. I've said no to investors. I have gotten a vibe, a feeling a uh, like the, the wrong offer and just been like, that's why you should never be desperate when you raise money because you have to be able to walk away from something bad. I have had bad investors um, where I was desperate and I needed to raise that money. I'm telling you all, it is the worst experience you will ever have in your life. It's a huge learning experience, but it is also devastating, you know, not only to you personally, but to your family, to whoever is in the boat with you in the business. It is, it can, it can be so devastating on so many levels. So, you know, be ready for a long game, be prepared, um, always be raising capital. Um, understand that the odds are stacked against us for those of you that are women and women of color. That is just the truth and be prepared, be prepared all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like war. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is war. It is war. <laughs> it is war. I would go to battle That's with you ladies just, any day of the week. <laughs> to add to that, so much focus is always about our story, which as Heather said, it's such an intricate part. It's important. 
But underneath that story, the business mind always have to shine. So take the time to be prepared. That way, when you go to present, at any moment, you're ready. When somebody asks you a question about your business, one minute you tell that nice story and then you tell the, the nuts and bolts of your business, why it is going to be the next big thing. Because one, two, three, four, five, six, boom. And just a quick question, before you share your numbers with you know, potential investors, are you, should someone ask for NDAs? What's that process like? Does it matter if your deck gets out? Oh, I was such, like, I wouldn't talk to you if I don't have an NDA. <laughs> because I learned from really early on what people can do with your ideas and your yeah. numbers and things like that, yes. And there are people that I would meet with and just get that vibe. It, there was just that gut feeling. Even with an ND, I still don't tell them anything because I'm like, I don't see us doing business together. It's all good. Yeah. So I always say, and Gian, I think I've said this to you and Jay too, you know, that initial deck, that like initial teaser deck that you put out there, don't put anything in it that you don't want literally the entire world to see because investors share decks. Like I hate to say it, but like, I cannot tell you how many times I've just been sent a deck randomly be like, this is awesome. Or like, check this out. Or I know you invest in this part of the space. And it's, it's not, I'm not under an NDA. I'm just getting an unsolicited deck from someone, right. Who just thinks I might be interested. So don't put anything in that teaser deck that you don't yep. want anybody to see. Once you have an NDA signed, you can give them a longer form deck. That's like, okay, I'm going to like divulge like something about the future or something about my numbers. Right. You want to be really savvy that way. Um, with that NDA, right? There's a, te you should have almost like a teaser deck that's just like kind of grabbed a couple of things from that longer form deck where you get a little bit more serious. The deck that you're going to present if they're really interested and have signed an NDA and literally never give anybody your financials without an NDA. Never, yeah. ever, ever, right? That is like coveted information. You don't want that getting into anybody's hands just because you did the work, you know? They didn't do the work, you did the work. Yep. Yep. I love that. Where, how can we support you? What are you ladies working on right now? Where can we find you? We're going to drop, you know, we're dropping your Instagrams and your websites in the chat, but is there anything you'd like to share with us? So I just got my first, and I'm saying my first publishing deal first, because there are a series of books in me with the third largest publishing house in the world, Hatchet Co., and this just blows my mind because it's been, it's taken forever, but that's how God works in my life. So I have that. And um, hey. I'm excited about it. I have a workshop. So if you know any mother or somebody pregnant with babies, please, I have a workshop that's coming up April 3rd about child nutrition because we have to stop this cycle of disease just helping our children not suffer from things that are preventable. So I'm teaching this workshop. Um, congratulations, Agatha, that is amazing. And I cannot wait to get all of your books. Um, Heather, what do you have going on? Uh, Agatha, congratulations, that's amazing. Books are really, it's so hard and it's amazing and I can't wait to read it. Uh, the first one of many. Uh, and for me, um, go by Good Sam. Go buy Good Sam, share Good Sam, follow Good Sam, do like go see what we're doing. We're doing some really cool work in the world and we need as many allies at the table. Um, and, and an ally to us, like I said in the beginning, is every part of the supply chain, every part of the value chain. And a big part of that is consumers actually picking up the products and buying it. Because without you, right, we're trying to create a revenue stream for these genius farmers who are really good at what they do and their product is valuable and beautiful. And I need as many people buying and eating it and talking about it as I possibly can. So please help us in that way um, to make the world a better place. That's really, that's really what we're doing. Where's the best place for us to buy Good Sam? So right now, Good Sam's only available on Thrive Market, but in about... 
30 days, we will be on our Shopify will open. So um, if you have a Thrive Market membership, go ahead and get and uh, and get it. Um, otherwise, you can get some discount codes on Thrive for a, a membership and free gifts and all kinds of things. So you can also DM me um, if you want that, and I will happily provide it for you. Yay. And organic bath cows also available on Thrive Market. <laughs> yes. So you can bundle. You can bundle. Yes. You can bundle. Good skincare, good chocolate. Um, thank you both so much for taking the time to get honest and answer questions and share your ambitions. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined. I wasn't able to get to all of the questions, but hopefully we can get Heather and Agatha back someday in person. I have haven't seen Agatha. I haven't seen your face in over a year. Um, but just appreciate both of you ladies and your time and everyone who joined us this evening. And um, you know, please stay tuned with Innovation Studio. We're always pushing content like this out and hosting panels and workshops that are free to you, thanks to our sponsors, um, you know, to really just help entrepreneurs be successful. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you so much.